and Manx Radio another radio replay, celebrating 60 years of the many varied programmes produced by the Nation Station. John Dog Collister is a familiar voice here on the Nation Station. From his gloriously Manx scrap metal adverts to various appearances on radio programmes and local news over the years. Saving specs for Nepal to popping up on the man in line and, of course, sharing his fierce love of the island on which he lives. Known also for his deafness at willow weaving and delighting kids with his bumby cages, he's also a keen poet and a Manx bard. But one of his main loves is the local countryside. So this evening's programme is a special one, a chance to hear again as Dog goes on a walk with Howard Kane in one of his favourite locations. This programme was first broadcast in 2010. A walk with... Wallabies and the curious gate posts of the Curragh with John Dog Carsten. Lovely and quiet this morning, no traffic to be heard for miles. Glorious morning, in fact, a typical, beautiful Manx winter's morning. You can tell it's winter because there's snow on the ground. Yeah, you can hear it. Well, look at that, and you'll recognise that voice with me today. It's John Dog, and we're out at uh, one of his favourite stomping grounds. Well, I think he has quite a few, really. And that's out on the on the Curragh, and coming down, and uh, we're just strolling down one of the tracks. And what are we paddling off to uh, have a look at today, John? Um, I suppose it's a long story. When I started with the museum, I, I helped create the pathways we've got out in the museum with my predecessor, who, when I worked at the museum, his name was Jonathan Fairhurst, and it was him and I that had the idea. He was in situ at the museum, so. We had lots of people help us, John Neal and Shirley Neal from out close Taggart in, in the Curragh. They helped and, and we created the boarded walks that are there now that people use regularly. Anyway, Jonathan created um, a method, apparently not very scientific, we were told, but they created a method of, of, of measuring the, the height of water in Black Curragh in, uh, in the fields, in the meadows uh, and so on, and also there was a board in the trench, Clairn Trench as it, as it is, or as it was. It doesn't actually go out to the Clairn now. It's been redirected out behind Close Taggart and actually goes out into the land. But it, it was the Clairn Trench. And there was a, a board there with uh, uh, depths on. And uh, uh, it, I suppose arguably it isn't very scientific. But after a, a, a prolonged drought, you would see that the, it would be at a certain level on the board and then you get some rain and it'd move up and down and, and people were interested and I was taking records. Anyway, when I left, my predecessor uh, like took all the, 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 uh, the equipment out to use and for measuring and in, including the board. So um, a number of people rang me, what happened to the board, what happened to the board and I've been going to and going to get round to do it. So recently I decided and... Uh, I got a board, um, Science Sense uh, made me the board, and I got a big stob, and uh, thanks to Haldane Fisher, they provided the big stob. Now we're, we're just getting to it, you see, that only looks about uh, six foot high, there's 12 foot of that, so there's a good six foot down into the, into the stream, knocked down, and I've screwed the board on, and it, uh, it now gives you the, depths, the depth of the river, the, the trench, the stream, at, you know, any particular time. You come for a walk along here, you can say, oh, it's a bit higher today, or come along and uh, it's a bit lower, and then in the summertime you come along and you know it's it's down round about, uh, it's in metres, but uh, and it goes against the grain a bit, but it was in metres before. I was going to say, yeah, yes, in metres I, know, I was, I was definitely goes against the grain, but but that's what was before, and I'm, I'm very old-fashioned, so it was metres before, I better do metres again. And uh, I, as a joiner, I work in millimetres, and, and when I put it in, it was about uh, um, 40 millimetres, 400 millimetres, or 40 centimetres. Uh, centimetres is a dress size, so we don't use centimetres, but it was about 400 millimetres. Now it's about 400 and, 410, 
you know, so that with uh, last night's rain and snow, it has lifted a bit. But it's it's just something that I wanted to do and, and put back in place, just so the people that walk around here regularly can look at it and say, oh, look, the, the river's up a bit or it's down a bit and so on. Not far away from this, we can see a wonderful slate slab. Let's have, let's go and have a take a look. Yeah. Just over one side here. So that's just over on this... Uh, there's, a, there's a board walk across... Board walk the, here. The, the, all these bridges across the, the trench are old slate bridges. Uh, the Isle of Man was never, never had a lot of timber, so the, uh, all the gate pillars are slate as we're standing alongside one, and these bridges would be slate, and you think this, this must be 10 or 12 foot long, a bit of slate oh, easily, to go across yeah, there. Easily. There used to be a hole in the middle there, and it was a bit dodgy sometimes. You'd go across and you'd put your foot down, so Larch Garrod, in her, when she was at the museum, um, I did some work in this field, some clearing of sallies and all, and uh, it was her who created this boarded walk over the top, because uh, my original walks used to be starting at sort of this point and going across that meadow straight ahead of us, and it's been cleared. It's it's now growing back. It it, it wants a coat of looking at, but uh, anyway, we'll see what we can do over that. But you were saying sallies as well. Sallies, what that like, young saplings or, or uh, willows. willows? Sally Sally is is uh, the, the you know the, the I suppose the man's name for willows. Salix, I think, is the Latin. That's maybe That's right. where it come from. So uh, I've always grown up calling them sallies. The sallies and birches. We can see one or two birches there, silver birches. But um, this kind of pillar here. Uh, it was obviously a gate pillar and there must have been, there's a bridge across and there must have been a gate. Now I've seen in the museum and I've got a copy of it somewhere and I, I, uh, I it's like everything else, you put it down somewhere and you lose it. Um, I've got a picture taken in the early 1900s and because of the peculiar shape of this slab, you can see it's exactly the same slab. And there's another one sort of where we are standing behind us in the picture. The, the roadway, which we... Um, it sounds very rude, but the Manx name for it is the Bollock Road. They, it, it, the Manx means uh, a road from a, a marshland going up into the hills, but that's the, the proper name for it. And this was the, uh, the road that come right down through where the wildlife park is now and, and come down through, and it was, it was blocked off when they did the, the wildlife park in 1965. Um, this roadway is sort of in the picture, and you can see, <coughs> excuse me, you can see your track marks in it, and in the corner up there, there's a gate. But the interesting thing is, no trees. Yeah. There's no trees about. Uh, you can see all the hills behind. Where we're standing now, you can't see the, the, the hills for trees, for sallies, as we were, as I was calling them. And yeah. just fascinated, it looks like there's been an enormous gate here as well at one well, stage. Yeah, there's a, uh, there's a gudgeon here, you know, a, a pin for, for, the, for the gate. So um, it's, you know, in its day, there'll be a gate on. It's going out into a meadow. In the corner here, I was saying, in the picture taken in the early 1900s, there's a gate there. And I, I know for a fact over there, there's like a bit of a hedge, but I'm sure that's a, that's a roadway going out and there's probably other meadows off that. And I'm interested in slates and, and I can take you around the, the, the curragh and show you loads of other gate pillars and all and, and slates that are in odd positions. You think, why is that piece of slate there? It's actually sitting there. Yeah, there is one particular gate pillar out there that I take people to when I'm going on a walk sometimes, and it's it's much taller than me. I'm not quite six foot, but it's much taller than me. And the gudgeon is up at eye level, so uh, most people just imagine if you're standing there, you're, the gudgeon is about you know belly button level approximately for a normal gate. Well, this thing is up at eye level, so it must have been a mighty gate on that. And alongside it, there's there's um, slates that have been put in the ground stood up to form like a barrier so you've got a, a huge gate and these slates but these things are only standing about four foot high so why the gate is is like six foot seven foot high i, I don't know but i often say it maybe it was a, a statement you know see my gate oh absolutely you yeah know, yeah bigger, uh, bigger than the jones i made a song okay look at that one <laughs> you know uh, there is on that stone too uh, jlc 1921 you know scratched so um I don't know who it was, but there was a, a man out here called John Leslie, uh, John Leslie Cashin, I think his name was. Oh, I uh, can't remember now. Anyway, that sounds like it, a good man's name. Yes, yes. <clears throat> yeah, so it it could have been he, him that was out here. You know, uh, his initials are on there. Right, well, let's stroll on down a little bit and see what we can see.
see the, the trenches. There we go. You see, well, across another slate bridge. Here you see. Yes, sir. Oh, oh, you can see the slate there. That's so that, a much that's, smaller one. That's running from there. That's three, six, seven, probably twelve. Twelve feet. Twelve foot to, to get a, a good base, and so maybe a bit longer to get a good base on either side. I, I believe. The, one of the best places from this uh, to get these was uh, Spanish Head. Yeah. Spanish Head. Had, had They've come a fair way then. Yes, they have come a fair way. And, and the principle was they would lower them down the cliff into a boat. They'd bring them round to the nearest coastline. Yeah. Throw them over, over the side at high tide. And then when the tide went out, they would go down with a horse and cart and pick them up, you see. That's how they, that's how they, they, they would get the stuff transported. And they do the same with the uh, the lime for the lime kilns. Yep. It would be brought round and kicked over the side, and then picked up. I heard too that they when they built um, Laxey Wheel, a lot of the stuff, the same thing happened there. There was mm -hmm. an Alf Valley told us a story about Laxey Wheel one time. There was about a hundred men on a big rope, and they were all pull pulling. And this fella, uh, Alan Gill from from Kirk Michael, said they were all pulling and all pulling, and the rope snapped. And they all fell over by one man, one man, he said, and they sacked that man, he said. They sacked him. And I said, they sacked him, yes, he couldn't have been pulling, he said. <laughs> so, you know, so, but that was the, the system. Just kick it over the side at high tide and then just come down with a horse and cart and pick it up. But a big long slate, 12 foot long, it must have took some hauling, must not it? Yeah, you're not kidding. Yeah, um, no. And there's quite a few bridges out here, you know, so... Uh, but it must have been important in its day for, for them to be prepared to, you know, just put the time and effort in to do that. And I suppose they had time, didn't they? Well, I suppose it'd be different in those sort of days, yeah. yeah. Just walking alongside one of the trenches here. We just yes, veered off the main track. Yeah, yeah, there's a stream track. Cars and strewn, I, I, I was calling it. It's, it's the, um, the one, as I say, it's right alongside the track and it uh, just follows down and it's... Uh, I was out here one day and I saw a big fin of a fish. I don't know what the fish was, whether somebody had put one in out of a, uh, an aquarium or what, but uh, I had a uh, witness with me as well. It was quite a big fin on its back, so I don't know what it was. It ju just caught a glimpse of this fin and then it disappeared. We both saw it too. Yes, you don't expect to see fish around here, no, I suppose. No, I have years ago with the kids come down with a, a net caught like a, a little stickleback type uh, or whatever. I don't know what it was. Uh, I... I, I never really, uh, never thought to kind of check. I just got it and put it in the jar, and the kids were looking at it and playing with it, and I let it, I let it go again. So, and I thought afterwards I should have tried to take some, uh, you know, dimensions. Yes, exactly. Well, it's always good to have these thoughts afterwards. <coughs> just underneath some ivy there. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a bit further. I assume it's a stickleback or a minnow, you know. Yes, chances are. Yeah. And yeah, here we are, very small. A little walkway across a tributary coming off. A couple of planks there, oh, up there. Just occasionally walking along the stream track, you, you see a dead wallaby. And uh, the wallabies are out here and uh, they uh, might, you know, come along and they get, they get caught in the river and they can't get out. And, uh, you know, probably like everything else, eventually they get to, uh, get kind of stretted. Yeah, uh, stre and they, they water get, soaked. Uh, and next thing they, they'll... Uh, they'll They'll perish and uh, you'll you'll find a carcass. A bit sad, really, isn't it? It's one. Uh, I suppose you, they do live and die down here, but there's one there. Good Lord. To speak of the devil. Now, how about that for timing? Incredible, yeah. isn't it? Sad to see one dead with a lie, but as John says, he's uh, uh, been there a while. Um, I wouldn't like to poke it. It might. Uh, no, I don't think it'd be a very smell, good idea. But as I say, sometimes they get in, and uh, like the distance across there. What's that? seven eight foot yeah it, it, it's just one leap you can see marks there where they've been kind of taken off and landing so just one leap but if, uh, if they make a mistake and just get caught in maybe scrambling out uh, is difficult maybe they've got a problem in the first place i don't know yes could quite often be either getting old or getting weaker yeah, or such like yeah. and can't quite make it but i'm afraid this poor chap won't be hopping any no. further he's uh just the remains yes been in for a yeah. well, good few weeks but it looks a bit we can still see the body there in the water that was uh, you know just talking about an age one there but that was uh, perfect timing and he yes. swears he didn't put him there earlier on no i didn't <laughs> been there too long yes <laughs> he's right You're listening to an episode of A Walk With from 2010, 
as our Howard Kane enjoys a wander through the Curragh's with John Dog Collister. Crossing the little, with these little plank bridges you find dotted around the Curragh, just over a little tributary so you don't have to jump or get your feet wet. Things out here. I don't know whether you can see. There's a, a rectangle there. That rectangle is probably about four foot wide and about eight to ten foot long, and it's very deep. Now, why and who did it? Uh, you know, there might be an easy explanation, but but somebody has actually dug out uh, a rectangle there. Yes, quite clearly defined. Uh, you can see it clearly defined, and I know for a fact I've, I've used sticks, and it's deep. You know, uh, uh, you wouldn't like to stand in it. So. Whether it was done for a purpose many years ago to, to dig turf or just to do it, um, but I've, I've never found anybody that knows why it was actually, actually dug. Done. And your best bet? A best, uh, or at least, yeah, best guess, I suppose best I should say. guess. Well, you see, it's, it's full of water at the minute. Uh, maybe in the summer where it's dry, you'll be able to dig down quite a way. And I, I don't know, maybe it was uh, archaeologists dug down or maybe somebody digging a bit of turf. But uh, the trees all around, it'd be dig difficult to dig through the tree roots as well. So, yeah, it wouldn't be easy. Um, and there's more than one. So uh, it's uh, it's just a, another thing about the Curragh that's interesting. And, and you know, it, it's we don't, we don't know half what went on years ago. It would be lovely to have somebody come back and... I'll do a Ouija board or something and find out. Get in contact. Yeah. 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 And you see there's a big big uh, birch tree come down there. And see uh, see the roots, because because it's only a skin on the top and down below it's probably only mush, the roots go out um, flat like a, like a pancake. And when it comes up, you've got like a big, a big circle of the roots that are all flat, nothing going down. Like you see drawings of a tree and a tree that goes up uh, in some of the trees you get the same shape going down to support it but obviously out here it's pointless doing that so all the root system is just a big flat kind of pancake yes you can see they're spread wide aren't they that's a big quite a big birch tree that's come down probably sort of pick age on it you know and that's uh, been blown over and uh, I wouldn't like to stand where it's come from because it, the, all the vegetation is probably dead and you'd probably go straight down through <laughs> chances are yeah. Well, we won't try that then. We'll just follow this track along, following by the gully here again, and hope we don't. Well, hope we don't bump into any more dead wallabies. Be nice to see a live one. But I suppose they've got to die, haven't we all? Just branching off right, and here we go. Once a slab or two here, a long side, slab. A bit of a hedge. You see, there's there's some there. This is this one here with a like a I don't know, like a, a latch for a hook to go into, it is, isn't it? Like an old iron ring set yeah. into the slate. So what what these are here for? Alongside us is a bridge. You know, where we can come over a bridge there. But I'll show you a little bit later on, a bit further up the stream there, only about 20 foot away or so, is another bridge. Why? Why have two? two. Big slate bridges, which are probably awkward to create. You know, think of the slabs, you've got to get them here. Why have two bridges 20 feet apart from each other? Yeah, a lot of work for uh, no yes. apparent reason. Yeah, it's a, you know, there's a lot of things out here that you, you don't know why or where for. We're just on, a, on, a, on what is, I would say, a roadway now, and we'll follow this roadway. Some of the biggest birch trees out here are, are, are in, on this roadway and I'll take you to show you this big slate slab. Pity we haven't got television. <laughs> yes, thanks television. Ooh, we're not going to go there. Right, it's just in front of us. Oh gosh, yes. Now look at this. Yeah. It's a good seven, good seven foot high. Oh yeah, it must be. It's coming above John there. And and it? and the gudgeon is is you know more or less uh, the, the more or less my height of my face. Uh, it's not very big. There's a there's a J. Ah, oh, here we go. Just below this, yeah, yeah just J. below chest height, more or less. J L C. 
Yeah, you can see that all being scratched into the surface. One, nine, two, and I think one. Might be a seven. Yeah, looks like a one, doesn't it? No, I go, I go with you. I go with one. So it's JLC 19. That's graffiti from 1921. It's disgraceful. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And I think his name was John Leslie Cashin. There was a fellow I've heard of, a name mentioned of somebody who lived out in the Curragh. But as you can see alongside, there are slabs that have fell over that were must have been in an upright position, a bit like a gate pillar, but in a line. And they, they've gone out about 8 to 10 foot on that side. And then we've got another big slab this side with a hole in for the oh, bolt yeah. for the Look gate. Oh actually going across and this is, yes, a hole there. Yeah. Again, and same sort of height and thicker yeah. than your finger. And then another line of slabs going out, not so far this time. But but it, you've got the roadway here and you've got a huge gate here blocking the way. And, you know, going back to what I said before, they were intact. Well, maybe this, whoever owned this area, this was his area and he wanted people to, to keep out, you know. I, I'm, I'm making a lot of supposition on what I'm saying, but, but obviously with the gudge in that high, the, the less of the gate must be getting up nearly to the top of that, so the top of the gate must be a good seven foot high. And, and if the slab's standing up alongside are only four or five foot, you're like, you're not keeping giraffes. Yeah. You understand me? You don't need a gate that high to keep the giraffes in if you've only got four or five foot long side because they can step over it. So if you understand me, it must have been a statement. Well, we're starting to walk back down the track and uh, there's another slate bridge just coming up on our right. And again, another slate gate pillar, which is... Uh, these, these things were discovered by me completely by accident in some, mistakes, some cases because they were covered in ivy and this one and the other tall one we looked at I happened to spot the gudgeon showing this, through yeah. the ivy and wondered what the gudgeon was doing and anyway I stripped it off and I found, see this one, it's, it's nowhere near as hard This is the beauty, it's lower but it's, but it's, it's much broader isn't it's it? It's much broader and, and there's a, a big gudgeon in there you see and we've just walked over a, a slate, again a slate bridge, another one across from here, but that's, uh, that, I took the ivy off that and it fell apart, the remains of it are on the floor there, but this is a, a sonker as we say, and it's, it's a wonder, and, and yeah, it's still fairly true as well. Yep, yes it's a uh, beautiful. Again, we're, we're seeing a good, probably a good five, when, if you clear this away, probably best part of six foot of it, so there must be another five foot down in. Going down into the ground. Yeah. Very solid and like I say, yeah. substantial this one. So yeah. You can see the layers across Beautiful. the top there and a good two inches thick yeah. and what, I don't know, two and a half feet wide. Yeah. It's a, it is a beauty that with this uh, gudgeon on the side there, which yeah. is still very they, solid. They would be leaded in. I was just thinking how they yeah. fixed in because it's still very put, solid in its yeah, mountings they'd, there. They'd put that in the hole, obviously, they'd, they'd be probably done by, well, would be done by hand. Uh, they would hammer and chisel and, they'd, and then they'd put that in. Some of them you'll find there's a nut on the back. Well, that has a nut on the back. There's a nut on the back of that one. Some have got a nut on the back. But um, you can just make out the lead. They also oh, yeah, you can heat lead there. up and pour lead in alongside. And the lead, a bit like fill and fix foam we use today, the lead would uh, run in and uh, fill all the spaces up and then go solid and, and hold it solid. Fantastic. There's not one down the bottom, but what, what they sometimes would do would have a stone on the ground with it with a with a cup mark a cup hole in it and you'd have a pin in the cup mark to, for it to pivot on and spin and then this would be for the, for the top Marvelous, a lot of gates you see today with a top and a bottom cudgeon but um, you know uh, a big stone with a hole in for a pin would be work just as well and that would take a lot of the weight as well yeah better, surely. better than the cudgeons you can hear the snow underfoot You can see a few more prints in the uh, snow here and there as well. Good track mark over there. Well worn. It is, isn't it? Look at that. Up over the hedge. This is obvious, a favourite route, obviously. There's a little mark down here as well. I don't know whether these yeah. ones down here. Yeah. Are these going to be wallaby marks again? They I would like think it. so, yeah. yes. Yeah. Not quite as big as the other ones, so maybe a bit smaller. You can see the prints coming down yeah. here. Now. I think we're only seeing like the front, the front, front paw prints, aren't they? Front paw, and you know why? He's running. When when they're just walking, when they're just walking, all you see is the flat 
of like a eight inches of flat, yeah. including the claws. But when he's running, he he's on his just on his front part of his paws, so he's come along here running. Well, I don't, they don't run, do they? Hopping, hopping, hopping is a better description. I wonder how they cope with the snow. You don't think of wallabies being able to sort right. of survive they're, they're, in, in they're freezing surviving. conditions. We've had, we've had worse winters than this. They seem to have survived. Marvellous. Always a good walk around here. Yeah. And always uh, nice to have a walk with John at any time of the year. He uh, never, never ceases to come up with some uh, interesting new facts for you. So it's, uh, we'll just say thanks very much to him today for a, a glorious walk. And uh, no doubt we'll see you again. Shade of eight. You're welcome. And that was the last in the current series of A Walk With. I do hope you've enjoyed them. If you have any thoughts or walks you'd like to see done, drop me a line at howardkane at manxradio.com or write to me, care of A Walk With, at Manx Radio Broadcasting House on Douglas Head in the Isle of Man, IM99, 1SW. Cheerio.